morning. So, yesterday we started uh, another topic related to mini and micro channels. Uh, this is uh, liquid flow, but two phase, two phase or phase change. You know, phase change is particularly concerned uh, with uh, you know, single component and uh, two phases, whereas uh, general two phase flows can be uh, adiabatic okay, and can be multi component. So, one can be an air and the other can be a water. Okay. So, we have seen that uh, general adiabatic um, two phase flows exist in so many different applications. Right? Any practical application that you take, whether it is in atmospheric sciences or biological applications or in heat transfer, you find two phase flows, but in heat transfer we are emphasizing more on the phase change part. So, where you have a single component and uh, uh, you have multiple two phases. Okay. So, typically this kind of uh, phenomena can be um, applied towards uh, electronic cooling. So, that is where primarily the micro channels and mini channels are being used and therefore, if you want to increase the rate of heat transfer, uh, we have seen that uh, compared to the single phase heat transfer coefficient, your two phase heat transfer coefficient is 3 to 4 orders of magnitude higher. Right? So, so this uh, stems from the, the basic boiling curve itself. So, if you um, look at uh, the basic boiling curve, which is called the Nukiyama boiling curve. So, you basically control the heat flux and you would measure the wall temperature. So, this is a basic experiment, which was uh, originally done about uh, nearly 100 years back now by uh, Professor Nukiyama. So, what he did was he immersed a, a heater coil okay, in uh, water which was uh, static and so he connected this to a power supply, DC power supply. Okay. And so, he controlled the power input and therefore, he controlled the heat flux <coughs> applied to this particular heater coil. And ha as he varies uh, the heat flux, you know he also has thermocouples on the surface of the heater coil. Okay. So, you can measure the temperature and average them that will be the wall temperature. And then he starts with uh, some low value of heat flux and gradually increases this. So, initially you see a curve which is going like this and when you observe the flow, pat flow regime or flow patterns, <coughs> there will be no bubbles. Okay. So, this is the point where you can say your uh, wall temperature is just above the saturation temperature. Okay. So, the saturation temperature for uh, water, if you take at one atmosphere, it is close to 100 degrees. right? So, he is maintaining suppose wall temperature 100.5. So, he starts slightly above the saturation temperature. So, just at the con liquid which is contact in contact with the uh, heater, you find the temperature is Close, uh, close to the saturation, whereas the bulk of the liquid will be more or less at room temperature. Okay. So, therefore, the kind of heat transfer will be purely by natural convection. So, there will be natural convection currents, which will be driving the heat transfer from the, the heated fluid at the heater towards the surface. Right. So, these are the basic natural convection currents. So, in that case the slope of this particular diagram will give you what? Heat transfer coefficient. So, you can actually measure Q versus T wall mi minus 
T sat correspondingly. So, your H will be simply Q wall, this is your heat flux divided by T wall minus T sat. So, till some heat flux this is going to happen. Now, if you increase the heat flux beyond this, you see that the wall temperature exceeds. So, so this you can call this, uh, the, you can start with say 1 here. So, this could be of the order of 10 and once uh, suppose the, the wall temperature exceeds the saturation temperature by 10 degrees. So, you will say that the liquid is reasonably well above the saturation temperature at the heater surface, near the heater surface. So, now this is the, this is the state which will induce boiling. So, therefore, if the liquid is above the saturation, it has to evaporate, right. It is not a very stable phase, okay. The stable phase will be to slowly start evaporating and transition to a vapor state. So, but in the process how the evaporation happens, so there are two things, one is the evaporation is a loosely understood word, evaporation is usually a surface phenomenon and in a normal context even at room temperature you can have evaporation and evaporation is driven by mass transfer, right. So, for example, if you take a water body, a big reservoir, so and you compare the fraction, mass fraction of water vapor in the ambient. So, this is measured by the relative humidity, okay. So, if the relative humidity is 10 percent, so that means you have very little water vapor saturated in air, okay. So, the partial pressure of water vapor in air is very little compared to the overall pressure. So, therefore, this partial pressure, uh, the pressure difference between what is at the interface minus what is in the ambient or the concentration difference is going to drive the evaporation. So, a few molecules will be excited at the interface has en enough kinetic energy and they can break free from the liquid state, they will become vapor because there is a very high potential gradient outside. So, that the, the, the liquid molecules can transition from a liquid to a vapor state and exist and this keeps on happening continuously till there is a relative humidity increase, okay. So, if it reaches 100 percent, then there is fully saturated, then there is no room in the surrounding atmosphere to hold any more vapor and the evaporation will stop. So, evaporation is purely a mass transfer phenomena and driven by concentration gradient, okay. And it can happen at any temperature, it need not be above the saturation temperature, whereas boiling is a bulk phenomena and it is not specifically surface process, it is happening throughout the entire bulk of the liquid and it is driven by temperature gradients. So, this is one, one of the most important facts, okay. So, that means you can consider an environment which is completely evacuated, there is no air, that means only vapor, so it is already saturated, it is already saturated. So, in this case there is no classical evaporation happening, okay. So, your air is fully saturated. Now, according to your classical evaporation, now there can cannot be any more phase change, but according to the temperature gradients, so your bulk of the fluid is at a temperature higher than the saturation temperature and this temperature gradient is going to drive the boiling process. So, phase change will happen because simply because, because of the diagram T s diagram or P v diagram, where if your temperature is above the saturation, this has to move from the saturated liquid to saturated vapor state, right. So, so this phenomena in boiling is a purely temperature gradient induced phenomena. So, therefore, you have to understand we sometimes use evaporation also to mean boiling. But evaporation classically means it is mass transfer driven evaporation, whereas boiling is temperature difference or temperature gradient induced phenomena. So, this particular new Nukiyama curve is purely a boiling curve, okay. So, we are not considering diffusion of uh, 
uh, you know species and mass transfer induced uh, change of phase. So, now at this particular point therefore, when it starts to change the phase how, how, how it happens is a very difficult process to imagine. So, typical explanation is that the heater itself should have some roughness okay, some elements which are rough enough to induce artificial cavitation sites for the bubble growth. So, you can zoom in and you can see that at the nano scale a few nanometers or maybe 1 micron size you can see that this is the cavity these are cavities formed by the roughness elements on the heater which will hold but basically the vapor locally right the phase change is happening right at the heater surface. So, this vapor has to sufficiently grow so that it can its pressure can be higher than the surrounding liquid pressure locally. So, it can form a bubble nice spherical bubble and then this bubble should be able to rise up all the way because of buoyancy and at the same time the pressure difference should be high enough for the bubble to sustain till the top of the surface. So, for example, if you are talking about very low superheats, right. So, there will be a bubble formation near the heater surface, but it may not have enough strength to rise all the way up to the top. So, it will just disappear, okay. So, this will not induce enough pressure for inside the bubble to overcome the surrounding liquid pressure and it will somewhere collapse. But as you keep increasing the superheat that that means, you keep increasing the heat flux you rise the superheats to say 30 degrees, 40 degrees, 50 degree then you will find that these cavities will now hold a lot of vapor okay, with sufficient vapor pressure right. So, correspondingly these bubble can actually have la much larger diameter near the surface and they can rise continuously till the surface and you will find that at the surface they will collapse right. So, this is what you observe when you heat water in a pan. So, initially you have only natural convection you can actually see the motion of the fluid due to natural convection and then you will slowly start seeing bubbles forming from the surface, but collapsing okay. As you continuously heat you will see that these bubbles grow in size okay because of higher vapor pressure because your vapor pressure is nothing but pressure corresponding to the corresponding temperature okay. So, the the more you heat the vapor so the higher the temperature is higher the pressure inside higher the vapor pressure okay because these are compressible substances. So, they you can use the ideal gas law for example. So, higher the temperature of heating of the vapor higher the pressure. So, therefore, once you have higher pressure of vapor near the surface so they can rise up to a longer uh, to larger heights and they finally, at the interface they have to collapse okay. So, this will continuously happening. So, as you keep rising the heat flux you will suddenly see that this slope will now increase okay. So, this is all the initial portion which is the natural convection where you get very moderate values of heat transfer coefficients. And then once the nucleation and bubble growth starts, so this regime is called the nucleate boiling regime. So, in this nucleate boiling regime you see all these bubbles growing and you see the bubble size corresponds to the amount of superheat. The larger the superheat the larger will be the bubble size and the number of bubbles also will be increasing okay. So, you will find that everywhere you find large bubbles and from which you know these rise and then you finally keep and this continuously happens stream of bubbles are generated which rise up to the surface and collapse right. So, this continues till some point of heat flux. So, as you keep increasing the heat flux you keep going up 
and you see that the slope of this is much higher than this. And rem uh, please remember, this is all in log scale in the denominator as well as here in the numerator. Okay, so you can say that initially you are starting with 10, so this could be 100, okay, this could be 10 power 3, then this could be 10 power 4 and so on. So similarly you have 10, so you could have 100, then you can have 1000, 10 power 3, then you have 10 power 4, 10 power 5. Okay. Now at some particular point what happens? The amount of superheat is so much so that completely the, vap uh, the surface is coated with only vapor. So there is so much of superheat and instant evaporation of everything near the heater surface. So the vapor film actually coats the complete heater surface and now this causes a decrease in the heat transfer coefficient because the vapor has lower thermal conductivity compared to water. So therefore this will add as a resistance to transfer of heat from the surface into the bulk and therefore the heat transfer coefficient will start dropping. So the slope becomes smaller and reduce and then it will actually start dropping. So what happens is in the practical case when you control the heat flux you do not actually go down. Okay. So the actual curve looks something like this, but you do not go down, you actually go from this point directly to a state here because by the time you increase the heat flux a little bit, so, so I, I, I should actually draw this, this is slightly higher than this. So this point should be slightly higher than this point. Okay. By the time you slightly increase the heat flux a little bit, it is already in the you know case where vapor is completely coating. So this is a film, film boiling regime and this inc increases the temperature of the heater surface. The heater surface rises but the heat transfer rate is not enough for the heat to dissipate directly from the heater surface to the bulk. Therefore, even if you increase Q, okay, so this is not efficiently getting dissipated, so your surface temperature will now tremendously increase. So it increases an order of magnitude. Suppose you are somewhere close to 400, 500. So from there it goes to few thousands. And what happens? That is the melting point of the metal. And immediately this entire metal fails this will break, the heater itself will break. So therefore, you directly go from this point directly to the point where it melts and breaks, fails. Okay. So this maximum value is called the critical heat flux. <coughs> so this is actually a like a you know, cautionary value, you know, it tells you do not operate beyond critical heat flux, always be much lower than the critical heat flux. So for every fluid and a particular surface combination you have a particular heat flux, when you do this experiment, so it depends if you use water with a particular surface, polished aluminum, you get a particular curve, if you replace this with a rough surface, aluminum surface, you get a slightly different he critical heat flux. If you use some other copper surface, you get so therefore it depends on the liquid and material combination depending on which you get different two phase curves and you have different values of critical heat fluxes. So you have to first understand what is the critical heat flux for a given working fluid and surface combination and you should always operate well below the critical heat flux to avoid this damage to the surface. So therefore you should always be in the nucleate boiling regime, so this, this is a very favorable re regime as far as heat transfer coefficient is concerned and as far as um, damage to the surface is concerned this is the safest part, uh, you know, regime. If you go close to the critical heat flux and marginally slightly above, so you di directly go and damage the complete heater. Okay. 
So, if you are controlling your heat flux, you cannot actually get this particular part of the boiling curve. So, for doing this, you have to control the surface temperature rather than heat flux. So, therefore, you have to put a heat exchanger and maintain the heater with isothermal condition and you slowly increase this temperature of the heater. So, then you will be able to go from this temperature to this temperature. So, all these are increasing temperatures, right. So, therefore, if you rather than using a isoflux condition, if you use an isothermal condition, you should be able to go through this route before you hit this particular point, okay. So, therefore, um, this is to give you a basic understanding and this is with pool boiling. That means, you have st static fluid in a container and you change the heat flux or wall temperature and you observe the flow regime. The same thing happens when you have flow, flow through a channel or a duct with a constant wall flux or a wall temperature. So, in that case, you also see that uh, these bubbles which form from the nucleate boiling will also move along with the bulk fluid and depending on the diameter of this bubble and depending on the vapor volume fraction. So, as you keep going from left to right, what happens? The vapor volume fraction is increasing, right. So, and depending on the vapor volume fraction, you have a two phase mixture with different regimes, okay. So, therefore, uh, in the flow boiling case, it becomes even more complicated because it is not only the temperature gradient which is driving the boiling process, but also the mass flux or the amount what is the Reynolds number at the inlet, correct. So, there is also an advection process which is driving the boiling apart from your temperature gradient. So, there is also combined effect of mass flux and heat flux in the case of flow boiling which makes it a little bit more complicated. But in general, so why do we prefer two phase regime? So, as you can see from this curve, your heat transfer coefficients are at least three orders of magnitude higher if you are operating in the nucleate boiling regime. So, therefore, whether it is a macro channel or a micro channel, we always prefer a two phase regime and in micro channel, although we already have a high value of H for single phase flows because of the small diameters, we still prefer uh, two phase flows because this still much higher compared to the single phase H, okay. So, most of the uh, applications in electronic cooling are actually in the two phase regimes in micro channels, okay. So, yesterday we saw the major difference between the uh, flow regimes in a macro channel versus micro channel. So, in the macro channel case, uh, one of the most important uh, difference is the effect of gravity, okay. So, therefore, you can you can actually say that you know in this case, this is completely driven by gravity and this is driven by surface tension. <coughs> so, uh, so, this is one perspective, the other is with respect to the relative uh, size of the bubble, the diameter of the channel is much larger in the macro channel case. So, very unlikely you find that one single bubble will occupy the entire channel cross section, okay. Whereas, in a micro channel case, many times you will find only one bubble occupying the entire channel cross section and it cannot grow further. So, it will be elongated along the length of the channel. So, usually you will find a bubbly regime where you have multiple bubbles and multiple bubbles simultaneously growing, coalescing and so on, okay. Coalescence is just merger of these bubbles when they come too close, okay. Whereas, here you find one single bubble which is nucleating which is growing, which is quickly filling the channel diameter and then then continues elongated, okay. So, the bubbly regime is quite different. So, you have uh, so many bubbles in the macro channel whereas, this is only one or two bubbles 
and also the elongation is very rapid in the micro channel case. Okay. So, two things, so one is the effect of gravity, so therefore what happens with the macro channel, the other disadvantage is it is dependent on orientation. So, that means if you keep this horizontal, you observe a different flow pattern, you, you can also have a stratified flow where the liquid can collect to the bottom and vapor at the top. Okay. Whereas, if you have a vertical mode of operation, you will probably see something like this. So, the flow pattern map here, it is actually for vertical mode. The horizontal mode, you will also find a stratification. Whereas, micro channel is independent of orientation. So, you whatever angles or direction you keep, more or less the flow transition will happen in the similar way. So, it is very advantageous to use micro channel where you know you, you put it on an object or a surface which is always you know reorienting itself towards gravity. Okay. So, for example, if you take a spacecraft cooling, okay, all the time its uh, attitude changes. Okay. So, if you have a ma macro channel, you will find that suddenly if a gravity becomes important in one particular orientation. So, you may find the flow pattern changing, which is not good. So, therefore, you can use micro channels in such a case where it is independent of these kind of gravity effects. Okay. So, uh, let us look at some important non dimensional numbers when it comes to phase change. Okay. So, I will start with uh, what is called as the bond number. Okay, so, this bond number is nothing but ratio of buoyancy force to the surface tension force. So, this is one of the most fundamental number when you look at micro, in fact I, I would go to an extent where I would strike off this because in some textbook uh, this is mentioned that this is less used, but I would say this is more used because you classify your micro channel based on the bond number. Okay. So, your bond number should be less than 2.5 for example, in order to clearly say that this is a micro channel where your surface tension is more dominant than gravity. Okay. So, therefore, so, this definition tells you the relative order of magnitude of gravitational force with respect to the, the surface tension force and we use this to classify in fact, what is a micro, micro channel, what is. So, you cannot simply use only the absolute numbers. For example, 100 micron for a particular liquid with a very low value of surface tension could be a macro channel, whereas 500 micron with a liquid with a very high surface tension could be a micro channel. So, we generally check the bond number, see whether it is less than 2.5 and accordingly we classify this as a micro channel. Sometimes the bond number is also referred to as Yertwos number. So, people in Europe use the definition of Yertwos number and people in US they use the bond number, but they are very similar. In fact, there are some slight differences, sometimes the yet force number can be defined as square root of bond number. Okay. But nevertheless, it is still containing the same information saying that it is the ratio of buoyancy to the surface tension force. So, you can also define another important number called the capillary number. So, the capillary number gives you the ratio of viscous force to the surface tension force. Okay. So, this is a very important number whenever you have flow through micro channels for example, where you classify the, the order of surface tension force to the inertia or viscous forces. 
Okay? So, if you have very low velocities, for example, so this v is the velocity, mu is the dynamic viscosity. If you have very low velocities, so then you typically have low capillary number where surface tension forces may be more dominant. And if you have very large velocities, then your surface tension forces may not be that important. So, your capillary, no capillary number tells you on cases where you can neglect surface tension force due to very high flow velocities, for example. Okay. So, this gives you a relative order of magnitude of viscous force to surface tension force or you can also say inertia force because of presence of velocity there. Okay. So, the other number is called Onshorge number. This Onshorge number is actually similar if you look at the way it is defined. Um, to the capillary number except that it does not have velocity in the numerator, but it is also ratio of viscous force to surface tension force. Okay. It also has density coming into the picture, so therefore it is also kind of clubbing some part of inertia force also in the denominator. Okay. So therefore you can say that it is a ratio of viscous force to the square root of inertia and surface tension forces club together. So, usually we do not use this much in micro channels, but mostly um, in atomization of liquid jets, okay, when the jet breaks up. So, we look at the criteria when the jet can break up very easily. If you have a very high inertia for example, and very low surface tension, okay. so you can talk about break up process depending on the values of von Scharge number. See the other number that we use um, is called the Weber number. So, Weber number is the ratio of inertia to the surface tension force. So, here G is the flow rate, volumetric flow rate. So, this is again very informative. Uh, in terms of channel flows, we do not use this as much as the capillary number because the capillary number and Weber number are interchangeably used and capillary number is more often used in micro channels than Weber number. Weber number also is used for impingement of droplets, you know mo motion of droplets where you are looking at the relative order of magnitude of the inertia force motion of the droplet to the surface tension. So, it tells you what will be the shape of this drop for example. So, if the drop has very high surface tension, it is more likely that it is well rounded and less subject to deformation. Okay. So, if the values of surface tension is very small, then it can actually spread more easily and it is more deformable. But in terms of micro channel notation, we use capillary number more often because the capillary number itself has part of the uh, motion that is velocity built into it. So, we do not have to again define a Weber number for that. Okay. But sometimes people use also Weber number. Okay. So, all these are just hydrodynamic quantities, right? whether you take bond number, capillary number, Onshorge number or Weber number. So, what about heat transfer? So, when you are supplying some heat flux to the wall and you measure the amount of superheat superheat to the wall that is the difference between the wall temperature and saturation temperature. So, how do you characterize the heat transfer? So, in that case we use what is called Jacob number. So, the Jacob number gives you the ratio of what is the sensible heat uh, divided by what is the latent heat, the ratio of these two, the sensible to the um, latent heat. Okay. So, this is a number which is usually used to see how well the nucleation can happen depending on whether you slightly uh, superheat it or you superheat it to a large extent or sometimes even you subcool it. Okay. So, because the first part the numerator part is simply nothing but the sensible heat part. So, it does not tell you that there should be a phase change. Whereas, the denominator tells you 
that in case of phase change, what is the amount of heat that you supply due to phase change? That is the enthalpy of evaporation. So it is a relative effect of sensible enthalpy to enthalpy of evaporation. If there is a lot of subcooling of the liquid at the inlet of the channel, so, so the sensible heat part will be higher compared to the latent heat part. Okay, then you know that you are mostly in the single phase regime. When you are talking about uh, values which are close to saturation or above saturation, then the latent heat part will be much higher. When you supply heat, the heat goes into the evaporation more than changing the temperature. So then the values of Jacob number will be much smaller. Right? So large values of Jacob number indicate more, more, mostly it is in the single phase regime and small values of Jacob number indicate that you are mostly in the phase change regime. Okay? So apart from this, we also have a few more uh, definitions. So one is called the Martinelli parameter. So what is um, interesting here, if you probably observe these flu, uh, two phase patterns is that you have a mixture of both liquid and vapor simultaneously. Therefore, how do we um, explain a model for pressure drop? So pressure drop now is because of both the components, liquid and vapor components. So therefore, to in order to explain the pressure drop, we define a relative ratio of pressure drop due to liquid to the pressure drop due to vapor alone. Suppose if this entire duct was filled purely with liquid, so what is the pressure drop due to the liquid alone? So that is the dp by dz due to liquid and similarly if you replace this by pure vapor, what will be the pressure drop? Okay, so this ratio is used and usually the liquid pressure drop will be higher than the vapor pressure drop. So therefore, this ratio will be usually greater than 1 and this is used to develop correlations for describing pressure drop of actual two phase mixtures. Okay? So they are all functions of this Martinelli parameter. Why? Because it is easier to find the Martinelli parameters because you know the friction factor <coughs> depending on the standard Moody diagram. So you can find out for pure single phase liquid or pure single phase vapor what, what is the pressure drop. So you can find this ratio and therefore the Martinelli parameter and depending on that you can build correlations for the actual two phase case as function of two single phase pressure drops. Okay? <clears throat> so usually this Martinelli parameter is used in two phase pressure drop models. Okay? So this is built in into that. So you know the Martinelli parameter up front depending on what is the uh, flow rate of liquid, what is the flow rate of gas, you estimate your dp by dx from the single phase friction factor correlations and then substitute into the empirical correlation to determine the two phase pressure drop correlations. So that is one important parameter. The other important parameter is called the convection number. Okay? So this is kind of x is here the quality of vapor or the mass fraction of vapor. Okay, that is basically your, you can define x as mass of vapor divided by mass of liquid plus mass of vapor or if you are talking about flow phenomena, you replace this by the flow rates. So this gives you the vapor mass quality. Okay, the higher the vapor content, higher will be the value of x and therefore the value of convection number will be larger or smaller, will be smaller. Okay. So depending on the volume for vapor, the quality, vapor quality being very low, you have larger convection number, vapor quality being very high, you have smaller convection number. So depending on this convection number, you can build correlations for heat transfer, heat transfer rate, heat transfer coefficient and so on as a function of this convection number because this contains the information with respect to the regime. So this 
convection number tells you in which regime you are in, whether you are in a regime where you, ha you are pure liquid or pure vapor or somewhere in between and depending on that you can build correlations for heat transfer coefficient. And similarly, the other important number similar the Jacob number, so Jacob number tells you the, the relative magnitude of the sensible to the latent heats whereas, we define another number called boiling number it tells you of, of the total heat flux that you give okay that is the numerator. So, what fraction of that is going as latent heat of evaporation okay. So, and also you can um, use this where you when you talk about the relative uh, influence of mass flux to the heat flux driven boiling okay. So, in the flow boiling case you also have mass transfer I mean because of the convection. So, you have to therefore, bring in a number to denote the order of magnitude of the heat flux driven evaporation to the mass flux driven evaporation. So, the boiling number relatively tells that importance of the heat flux driven evaporation to mass flux driven evaporation okay. and usually this is used only in flow boiling. So, in pool boiling you do not use boiling number. Okay. So, these are some of the numbers uh, th there are also other parameters uh, which, which can be defined not so important, but uh, the most important parameters are the bond number, capillary number, Jacob number, boiling number, Martinelli parameter and convection numbers. So, based on this you can actually build a lot of correlations for different regimes. So, just before we stop today I will show you some of the flow regimes that are there for macro channels and um, so you can you can see very clearly there are two distinct regimes. So, one towards the left So, this particular regime is a classical two phase regime where you can have two different components okay, with adiabatic conditions you can mix them and you can produce this. So, one is obtained when you have vertical mode of operation the other is when you have horizontal mode. So, this is your adiabatic two phase flow. So, the other is your phase change. So, when you heat this tube what happens? Now, this is the phase change two phase flow and this is in vertical mode of operation the other is the same phase change in horizontal mode. Okay. So, therefore, you can have different kinds of two phase flow pattern maps, flow pattern regimes and maps. So, one where you do not heat it you just mix air and water in different proportions in different mass fractions and you generate whether you are in a vertical mode or horizontal mode different patterns. So, that is the adiabatic case the other is you heat the tube you pass liquid at one end purely and you start heating and you observe how the two phase changes regime changes from one end to the other. So, there also you can have a horizontal and vertical mode because as I said the macro channels are sensitive to the orientation. Okay. So, therefore, typically when you start with a single phase liquid and you start heating you see the bubbles multiple bubbles forming and these bubbles elongate they become what are called as slugs and these slugs continue elongating. So, the core is filled with vapor, but it is surrounded by a thin liquid film at the annulus which is sticking to the wall. Okay. So, now this core keeps increasing in size and finally, you will reach a point where this is called a mist flow. That means, the entire tube is diameter is cross section is filled with vapor and the liquid is trapped as fine mist within this vapor. So, it is just like your fog you have full full of uh, vapor and inside that you have trapped liquid so elements. So, the same way finally, as the the mass fraction keeps increasing 
you have very little of liquid. So, this liquid gets entrapped within a complete vapor and becomes a drop flow or a mist flow and finally, even that evaporates and you have pure vapor. So, progressively from the inlet where your uh, mass fraction can be equal to 0, you can reach a mass fraction of 1. If you continuously heat this and this tube is sufficiently long enough, you can see all these regimes happening. And same way if you orient it in a horizontal direction, you will get similar patterns except that some pattern here is influenced by gravity and you have stratification of the liquid down and vapor upward. So, you will not have a clear annular uh, flow like that you find with the vertical alignment in the horizontal case. Okay. So, there you have a perfect vapor core surrounded by liquid. In the horizontal alignment, the liquid will kind of settle down and the vapor tend to settle up and you have a stratification. But after that, as your mass fraction keeps increasing here also, it will slowly go towards a, a mist flow or a drop flow and finally, it becomes pure vapor. Okay, so, tomorrow we will look at the flow regimes in the mini channels and I will quickly go over these regimes and then we will look at the correlations for pressure drop and heat transfer coefficient. Okay.